Right. Well, well welcome to this afternoon's session. Uh, so our speaker this afternoon is uh, Simon Van Rij, who's a urologist at Auckland Hospital and also works in private at Mercy Ascot. Are you ready to go, Simon? Yep, we're all ready to go, thankfully. Yeah, we've done a, a move around the house to try and get these computers working. The kids are now, who knows where they've gone, but we'll see. So hopefully you won't <laughs> see them in the background. So I can imagine for a lot of you sitting out there kind of going, hmm, men's urinary symptoms in the time of coronavirus, do we really, really need to, um, you know, do we need to be looking into this? And I think that we've got to be aware that, <clears throat> Uh, and we've got to believe that we will get through the coronavirus um, and that there will be um, there will be a number of patients who will be putting off coming to see the general practitioner who will come in the future. Also, I think that the men who are going to turn up to your practice, they're going to be people who do have quite significant symptoms. And so I do think that we need to be aware that, that they will need treatment. Um, as I said, I work at Auckland Hospital mainly. Um, I'm involved with the e-referrals, so I see a lot of e-referrals that come through general practitioners. I'm also involved with the Ministry of Health in terms of the tumour standards, particularly around prostate cancer. Um, I work at the Urology Institute. Um, Eva Fong, she's going to be presenting later on about Mesh. She's the, the real superstar of urology, and she's really dedicated her career to urinary incontinence and Mesh problems. I have to say my wife is a, a general practitioner. And I just wanted to stop at this point and just really um, thank general practitioners. You guys are at the front line at the moment of everything that's going on. It's been stressful. I've seen the stress for my wife, you know. And it's crazy as doctors, we've had probably one of the biggest weeks of our lives in terms of medical things. And we're all here on a Saturday still learning. And so don't take things too hard. Don't try and take too much from today. Let's just keep it nice and straightforward. I've also put the QR code there. You can take a picture of that with your phone. It will take you straight to a link to this presentation. Um, things that I really want to cover across and, and as we talk uh, are outlined here. Um, and I'll run through that really, I think, with, with a case. But I always learn things when I present. Um, and these are some often some of the questions I try and ask to kind of stimulate some discussion. And, and the advantage with the webinar is that you guys can write questions and not be worried about, oh, is that a question? that I should ask or not, because you've got the normality of being online. Uh, I'm gonna start off with the health pathways. We use that here in Auckland. It's um, updated by urologists. It really does link into all our e-referrals. There's click down boxes. I think they're great resources. And just, you know, last, this was my clinic uh, on Tuesday. It was supposed to be a, a normal clinic. It got turned into a virtual clinic. And it was just really to show that there is a really wide breadth, breadth in terms of men who present with urinary symptoms, so not just all straightforward. And so before we go any further, I think it's good to, to start with the case of a, of a patient. Um, I'm glad I didn't put Boris Johnson up there today with everything that's going on for him. Um, but he's a 76 year old man who's having trouble going to the toilet. And before we dive into the case, I think it's important to remember that not all urinary symptoms are because of your prostate. And also a lot of men get concerned, particularly if they get an ultrasound that says they've got a large prostate. Oh, that means I have to have cheap treatment. That's not necessarily the case. Now, on our WhatsApp group at home around the country, we've been taking pictures of what we've been doing each day. And this was the picture that I sent on Thursday of a patient of mine who we'd removed an organ. And we, the question went out, what organ was, was this? My son thought it might have been a heart or a penis, but actually it is a prostate. And what you can see here actually is a very large median lobe in a prostate. So it's important to remember that it takes two things to tango with urinary symptoms. It's the prostate, but it's also the bladder. And so symptoms and causes can come from both of those. And it's important also to remember that it can sometimes not have anything to do with the prostate, and it may well be a fluid-related issue. So we need to keep these things in mind. And so when we assess patients, this is what we look for. And, and these are the actual questions that I ask my patients. And I always start with a, a, an opening question about what is the biggest bother. And then I really try and break it down into daytime symptoms and nighttime symptoms. And you know, you need to talk in the language that your patient understand. They do not understand urination or flow. You know, they want to know to know about peeing and, and things like that. So use that kind of language when we talk with our patients. And the most important thing is the bother. 
and these are the key questions that I ask. You know, if you had to live the rest of your life the way your symptoms are today, how would you feel? And actually, more often than not, now what I'd say is, do you think your symptoms are bad enough that you take medication to help? Because often then that will kind of give you an idea of what the degree of bother is. And the final thing that I often find is that people come to see you with urinary symptoms, but actually they're concerned about something else. And so just being aware that sometimes actually they're there because they're worried that they may have cancer and addressing that in the consult. Now we use the IPSS or the AUA score and these can be helpful. We also use bladder diaries. Um, I'm keeping this moving fast so that we can have questions. And the key thing is to make sure we rule out those red flags. So looking for the blood in the urine, new pain, a classic overflow and confidence symptoms, a patient who doesn't know that they've been wetting the bed and wakes up and the bed is completely wet. That's often quite a red flag. So we come back to the patient that I was describing, the 76 year old, he has some urine dribble, he has some medical conditions, but nothing overly abnormal. Is an exam helpful? It's just interesting, I was just reading my wife's New Zealand doctor and there's a, an article in there today about a patient um, who complained to the HTC about a, a PSA. And one of the, the key issues was around the patient hadn't had a DRE or a PR exam for four years. Interestingly, the, the HD people thought that that was quite an issue. Um, so I do think a rectal examination is helpful. Very rarely some men may have phimosis or stenosis of the urethra, and so you do want to rule that out. Do we jump straight in and treat them, or do we need to do any other tests? For a routine patient, I think you can jump straight in. We shouldn't routinely do a lot of these tests if we don't actually need to do them. So it's a prostate problem, this man, he needs an alpha blocker. Which one do we use and which dose? Well, funded currently is non-selective, so we use doxazin first, but you do need to titrate the dose up. And one thing that I do see a lot uh, is the underutilization of tensilosin. So this is a selective alpha blocker, uh, so it should therefore uh, minimize postural hypertension. And you, you can even start your patients on it without, um, without starting them on, on a non-selective alpha blocker if you really think that they're not going to tolerate that. So I see a lot of men, particularly over the age of 80, who would benefit from tansilocin, so it is something good to think about. We do need to be wary of side effects. We all know about postural hypertension, but in younger men, uh, it can have an effect on their sexual function, in particular the ejaculation. The next line medication is finasteride. Now this is a special authority medication, so they either have to not tolerate an alpha blocker or failed medical therapy on an alpha blocker. It doesn't work if you've got a small prostate. It shrinks your prostate. So if you have a small prostate, it won't help. And we do need to be aware that it will have an effect on their PSA level. How do I use it in my own practice? Well, I use it as a second line agent. I generally avoid it in younger men because usually they don't have big prostates and they're very worried about the potential sexual side effects. And as I say, it, it is actually shrinking your prostate. It will not happen overnight. It will take time. And so patients need to be aware of that. So if we look at this patient that I was talking to you about, he does have improvement in some of the symptoms, but has ongoing irritative symptoms. And this is often the, the point where people you know, think, well, maybe they need to go and see someone further or we need to think about some further treatment. And in the past, all we had available to us as first line agent was oxybutynin. Now this is a very uh, side effect prone medication of around 70% of people who start this medication stop it. Um, and it's now with, because of all these symptoms in particular, the dry mouth um, and also constipation. So solifenicin is now fully funded. You don't need to start them on oxybutynin first. And so it should be the standard treatment. I know that people are sometimes aware of worried about urinary retention by giving this medication. It is very unusual for that to be the case. And in general, if they haven't had a benefit within a week, I would stop it. But it's definitely worth a try in that situation. The issue though that often happens is that we can give all of these things, but they continue to have nocturia. And nocturia is difficult to treat and then it's because it's of multifactorial cause. And so when I'm discussing with the patient, I'll explain that there are a number of different reasons why it may be the case they're getting up to go to the toilet at night. 
And you can break that down into three categories. Either they're just producing urine all the time, you're producing more urine overnight, so nocturnal polyuria, or there's just a bladder storage issue as we've been talking about. So we need to be aware of that. And actually, as general practitioners, you're in a, a great position to do this because you have the expertise uh, to look into some of these other causes. And the NICE guidelines are actually written by general practitioners. I know I've rushed through that quite quickly, but we lost a bit of time. Um, and if we have any questions coming through, then we can break to those. Do you want some questions, Simon? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll finish off this little extra bit and then we'll go into that, but... Um, yep, keep going, couple, yeah, keep going. A couple of scenarios that I find difficult or harder to manage, younger men with urinary symptoms, and the hard thing in these is often it isn't BPH, so as a urologist, I can't go, I'm a plumber, I'm just gonna unblock the pipe, sweet as, and so we have to often think about some other things, and often I approach, approach it more you know, as an overactive bladder or a pelvic uh, pain syndrome. Um, we do need to rule out stricture, but it is pretty rare. You've either got to have had probably previous surgery or very rarely there are some cases of SDIs causing strictures. I would not never perform a PSA in a man under the age of 40 unless I did a rectal examination and I thought there was a very abnormality there. You know, you're just exposing them to a years and years of PSA testing. The other one that I find difficult is the 85 year old or the, the elderly man who may be in a rest home, he may have dementia. And we really, in these scenarios, have to be very upfront. There was a, a great study that showed that men over the age of 85 having a TERP, actually most of them usually died within you know, 18 months. And so we have to be wary in terms of, are we over treating people in this situation? Are we being upfront in terms of the risks of it? All medications will have side effects. I get letters from the geriatricians uh, who are always very concerned if I put men on to anticholinergics um, in terms of dementia or cognition. And so we do need to be aware of that. And also about the goals of treatment. We may get them rid of the catheter, but they may be up six times a night. And actually, if they are a falls risk, are we doing them any favours with that? And who's driving the treatment? Is it the family? Is it the patient? Is it the rest home? Um, who, are, who are the people who are driving that? and talking them with, with them about different options in terms of incontinence. And you know, that picture there on the right is of meatal drop from a long-term catheter, which can happen. And that's why often for some patients, we move to suprapubics in those situations. The other is urinary retention. Um, and there's two forms. Acute retention is when you have pain and you can't pass urine and they need a catheter. Um, the harder one is actually the chronic retention. And we often get those urinary ultrasound reports where they say, oh, there is a significant retention of 150 mils or whatever. And, and those can be hard to know what to do. In itself, it doesn't need treatment. It just can lead to further problems. And so we need to be monitoring their kidney function, monitoring for infections. And also surgery may not necessarily fix those problems. 30 seconds on surgery. What are we trying to do? We're trying to widen the pipe. We're trying to minim minimize side effects. We can't make the bladder squeeze any harder. There's no medication or surgery that can make the bladder squeeze harder. It takes two things to tango. You need the pipe to be open and the bladder to squeeze. You can make the pipe as wide as possible. If the bladder doesn't squeeze, then you can't succeed for the patient. So there's a number of different options on the market. We need to be aware that advertisement has got better. The companies now who have new products, they may not necessarily be better, but you can tell that they've got a much better marketing budget. And so the videos that the patients find online will be much better. And so we need to choose the right treatment for the patient, not the other way around. And often, you know, just having a basic understanding can be helpful when these patients come to see you about what's gonna go on. What do I say? For any patient coming for surgery, it's about risk versus reward. If your symptoms are bad, you will take on the small risk for that large reward. We need to assess and manage them for them, not what they think that they need. Um, and that it is not a procedure for cancer, so they should take their time deciding and know what the goal of their treatment is gonna be. So I think that has covered some of those aspects and I'm happy for us now to maybe have some questions. And as I said, at the end, I'd like to just spend a few minutes talking about what's been going on with us with the COVID virus. 
Uh, Simon, got a question there um, to do the, um, I'm just trying to get the flow chart uh, slide again uh, for Nocturia. Could you bring the slide yep. back up? Um, and then another question was about um, relationship of doing a DRE and then testing PSA. How long should you wait uh, to do that? Yep. So in terms of answering about the DRE, no PSA is ever an emergency. And so it's not, I would say to them, I would wait a couple of weeks before I did the PSA. Um, afterwards, no one really knows, you know, there's always these questions around sexual activity, around bike riding. Um, I always say to a patient, if you always do the exact same thing before you have the PSA test, and that's the best way to do it. It's probably easier to abstain from biking or sexual activity for two days than always make sure you do those two things before you do your PSA. But it could be a reason to do both. Right, right. Um, okay. And in terms of the diagram, um, one of the ways that we measure nocturnal polyuria is with the bladder diary. And so that's often the most helpful reason to do that. So if you're present, you know, if you look at more than one third of your urine being produced overnight, then you're fitting more into that nocturnal polyuria. Right. Okay. So got a um, complicated question here. 78 yeah. year old present with on Wednesday night with one day of frank hematuria, patient was on blood thinners, aspirin and clopidogrel for a recent stent December last year, consulted with ED and said he said patient did not need to come into hospital unless he was in retention. Yeah, so frank hematuria, uh, I think it depends on the patient's situation, where they live, what's going on. From my perspective, I think if you passed hematuria and you're stable and your urine is coming out, then in general, um, we wouldn't admit them to hospital. Patients who are worried about are patients who are passing clots because I think they're in imminent danger of going into clot retention. And in essence, then the other patients we admit are those in clot retention. The hard thing in people on blood thinners is that we can stop them, but the effect won't happen straight away. Um, so I think. It depends on the patient. Um, you know, if we look at the acute ward, we usually have around 10 patients in hospital under us with acute hematuria and clot retention. So it's a very common presentation. Reassuring the patients to drink plenty, but if they're worried that they're going into past clots or they're in retention, then they should be admitted to hospital. Uh, any guidance around how often a GP should uh, offer a DRE in an older male? Yeah, this, uh, as I said, it's an interesting just and in, you know reading this HDC case. Um, I think that if I in an older man, I think if we looked at men over the age of seventy and the men over the age of eighty, uh, I think over the age of eighty is easier. If they were symptomatic, I'd do a DRE. If they weren't symptomatic, I wouldn't. Um, if I've done it before, then you know maybe every one to two years. In a man over the age of seventy. It can be a little more difficult because we're getting very fit 70 year olds who have many years of life left in them. But in general, you know, if you look at the screening guidelines, they're talking every two to three years. So I think as long as you have a plan in place that you'll do it in the future, I don't think it has to be done more than that. Some people, if they come to you on a yearly basis for it, it's something you can do as part of that. Uh, what's considered a large residual volume? Yeah, and that's that's the that's the million dollar question often because for me it depends on the patient, you know, and so it's residual volume is one aspect and there's variability in that. So often when these patients go for renal tract ultrasounds, they've been told to drink lots of fluid. And so they drink lots of fluid, and so actually that's why they may have a little bit of residual because the detrusive pressure, you know, you can only empty so much. And so that's just one part of the assessment. So in itself, it comes back to bother. If bother is a problem coupled together with a residual then then you take that into account but when they write significant routine you know urinary residual on the ultrasound reform from my perspective I don't take much into account unless the patient actually has symptoms okay um, how long should we be we put patients on alpha blockers before adding finasteride um, I think if you look at the data 80 percent of men should have some benefit on an alpha blocker when they start it if the first step would be to titrate the dose up, 
Um, after that, I think if you know, in general, if you have noticed no benefit within a month to you know two months, then that's the time to consider adding in finasteride. And I think that's where the advantage of having done a rectal examination is helpful because if you felt the prostate and it felt really small. And this is one thing that, that I do find is that a man who has a smaller prostate, when you do a rectal examination, it will feel firmer. And that's because it's just smaller. Um, so just be aware of that when you do examine young men, because often when you get asked, oh, I think I'm not sure if it's normal or not, it can just feel firmer. As long as it symmetrically feels normal, then I, I wouldn't be concerned. But um, starting finasteride, usually at least a month or two with the, the doxazacin or the tamsulosin first. Um, what effect does mild chronic prostatitis have on PSA levels? I know in acute prostatitis they go very high and I foolishly measured a PHA in a patient in that uh, situation and had to sort of repeat it. Um, so what, what would you answer that, uh, Simon? Well, sometimes when we do do biopsies on patients, we do find active inflammation in the prostate. And that often is a helpful thing because it can give us an idea of why the PSA may have been elevated. Um, chronic prostatitis is, is a condition that we're kind of trying to move away from because it implies that there is inflammation or infection, whereas for many men they have urinary symptoms um, causing bother. So the, the issue with, about that is that, from my perspective, I think in, it's about keeping things simple in primary care. If the PSA is above the reference range and there's no other reason why, then they should be repeated and if it's still elevated then to refer on. Um, we often can make these distinguished and oh, I think this is because of this prostatitis or not but unless we've ever actually done further investigation I'm always a little bit weary of, of kind of putting the PSA being elevated down to just that. What What is the predictive value of a series of low PSAs? I've, I have read that that's pretty good predictor of not getting prostate cancer long term. Yeah so if you're up yeah, if you're under the age of 60 and you have a PSA less than one, your 10 year chance of developing significant prostate is, is less than kind of 1%. So this is the problem of screening and, and not going too much into detail, but where you can tailor things much more, but then it becomes more complex. But in general, the only reason I often see for a man in the age of 40 to 50 to get a PSA is to basically stop them having PSA tests for another five, 10 years. <laughs> I like it. Um... So, um, hang on. Uh, uh, do you have a position on PSA for asymptomatic with men with no family history of CA prostate, but worried? This is this is the heart of primary care. Yeah, and and that's it's a an, another talk in itself, but. But in essence, I think the key point is that there is time and that this is where, you know, the new tools that have been released on MedTech, you know, uh, BPAC have released that tool for patients in terms of their PSA, you know, the Cooper websites, things like that. I, I reckon that my position would be to try and defer it straight away and say, go away and have a think about it. But it's about being informed. And as long as you are informed and you make the decision that's right, and that in a discussion, you talk about the pros and the cons of it, um, then, you know, I think there, there's a great benefit from, in, you know, you see men who do benefit, but also men who, who can cause harm. So, you know, uh, being informed and making sure it's documented in, in that, letting the patient know that a single PSA test will never be enough and that you always want to follow things up. I think you may have sort of answered this before, but when testing for PSA, what ex activities does he need to stop uh, doing prior to the test and for how long before the test? Yeah, so uh, I know that, that are often some of my urology colleagues are particularly strong. The evidence around it is not great, um, but in essence, if you try and limit variables, as I said, so each time you try and do the test at the same lab, try and do the test with the, um, the same kind of uh, activities that you've been doing and there is thought around bike riding or sexual activity because PSA is in your semen and so a small amount leaks out maybe that small amount leaks out you know with those activities and so if you can compare your PSA tests because as I say to patient you, you, you do your PSA every day of the week and there'll be a, probably a 20% variability across the test and so you just try and limit to take out the variables. I think we're having a few um, answers to the PSA acronym. We've got 
promoting stress and anxiety. So uh, it certainly does to GPs. So uh, uh, perhaps we can have a little competition on that, different definitions of PSA. Um, so COVID-19, are we still going to be able to email for advice? Is this service still going to run? Uh, PSA, how long can we safely defer these in someone who has had a PSA elevated and this is a follow-up level? Yep, so that's that leads me into kind of talking about this. So as urology, we're, we're looking at those further down the track and, and as I put in my quote and there's an article just published in one of our major journals from the Italy urologist talking about, you know, what's been going on. We're obviously like all of health professionals trying to limit in-person consultations, but we've the advantage of urology is that we can move to, to a virtual format very easily. Um, and so what do I see in general practice in particular? One, I think patients, you know, are not going to attend, you know, because they know they don't need to attend at these times. And so routine screening is unlikely to happen. And I wouldn't be doing any PSA testing during this time unless you thought they had an overt metastatic, you know, cancer. It's very safe, you know, we will be advising all of our patients on the e-referrals that you should just repeat the PSA in four months time. You know, no, nothing in prostate cancer needs to be done within that time frame. So no men should be concerned about that. Um, so, I, you know, the, the easiest thing is not to do the PSA rather than to do it. Um, the hardest is often the men who have been had that test and they're waiting for the next one. Um, that's more difficult. Um, who do I think that you actually need to see? Well, as I said, most of urology can be done virtually. Um, sometimes, unfortunately, a photo may help. I need to make sure I have locks on my phone for some of the photos that I get sent. Um, and medically, legally, I think that the things that I'd be worried about would obviously be scrotal masses, so, you know, in the younger male. Um, and having these men who, who come to see them and just ensuring that in four months' time that that PSA has been put in the system so that they can be followed up. And uh, I think if you see something bundling, sorry, yep, you were going to say something? Well, no, no, carry on, yep. Um, I think we, we know how much under the pump you are, and I just wanted to take this moment to, to thank, you know, general practitioners for the work you guys are doing. You guys are at the front line of what we're doing. Um, I know my wife, you know, seeing what they're doing, you guys are under stress, you're under resource stress, financial stress, and we're aware of that um, in the hospital, and so, we want to be more available. You know, we've cut down our elective surgery, so you can direct call us because, you know, my clinic, my theatre has been cancelled on Monday. I'll be doing a virtual clinic. So make sure you do still send e-referrals, direct call us. You know, even if you haven't seen the patient, they have barn door urology, you should be sending them on. I think there will be a change in patients very soon. Um, in terms of that they will not want to come to the hospital. You know, if you look at what happens in Italy, with these hospitals, New York, you know, when they get overrun with COVID virus, patients are not going to be wanting to go there. And so you may also end up having to manage some of these things in primary care and be aware of that. Well, um, just talking about the e-referrals, you, you say you're the one yeah. who reads them. What yes. sort of things could we do that would make your life easier? What, what, what would be a couple of take home messages that could sharpen up the referrals? Well, the electronic ones, oh. Uh, much better, I think, than the old days, but um, I imagine there's always room for improvement on these things. I think I think you guys are under the pump in, in general, but I think it's actually technology and we need to get better with technology. You know, and I think this new med tech where it's going to be able to cut and paste in all the PSA results, I think that's going to be great. Um, you know, being aware of health pathways, we're aware in urology, we're a small specialty, you know, you guys don't see much and so uh, I think as much information as you can give is helpful. Being aware of some of those pathways, particularly for some people who have conditions that may not need to be seen, can be helpful. Um, but sometimes patients also need that kind of letter back from the specialist saying, yes, we've been aware that you have this and we think that you can be managed uh, in primary care. Um, but in general, I think for urology, most of the referrals are, we don't have a real problem with. Um, yep. Oh, that's yeah. good. good to hear. The other thing I like about the health pathways is you can actually, there's a box at the bottom if you have feedback, if you find something good or not so good, uh, they're amazingly responsive. They get back to you within a day and then they think about it and get back to you within a couple of weeks. So I've been uh, pretty impressed with the iterative 
basis of those pathways, I think um, you know the product's always improving. I've um, got a question here. What do you do in your urinary symptoms from Parkinsonism? Yeah, that's a hard one um, because the issue is that often it's a neurological aspect and it's a real bladder issue rather than a prostate issue. But the biggest issue that we're always worried as urologists is we operate on a person with Parkinson's that have a much higher rate of incontinence post-surgery. Um, and so surgery is really a last ditch effort in Parkinson's patients um, because we're worried about that. Um, and so expectations around treatment have to be kind of discussed in that often it is early use of anticholinergics um, and early use of medication. And sometimes this is where we use urodynamics um, pressure testings to get clear ideas of whether or not they're truly obstructed or whether or not this is actually more of a, a new, you know, from the central nervous system. Got a question here, just could you put the barcode back up, Simon, so that um, uh, I'm not sure whether our, whether your slide set's going to be available separately on the website. I will just see if we can find out from our um, IT person. Um, Jeep is weird. I, I'm probably missing it because I can't see. It was right at the beginning, I think, wasn't it? One of the first yeah. slides. Yeah. And just the final point I was going to kind of was going to make around um, operating is that all acutes will still be going ahead. Um, the what has we are limiting elective surgery, and that's to try and preserve resource um, and also. You know, there's good evidence coming out from New York, particularly around, you know, asymptomatic people in the theatre, the amount of virus that they could spread if they were operated on. Um, and that's hard for patients. You know, patients can be concerned. And in particular, we will still be operating on people who need surgery within six weeks. That is not prostate cancer. Um, even high-risk prostate cancer, we probably would, would still do. But it is a hard conversation I've been having with patients this week, telling them that we are deferring their surgery. Um, and so patients need to be aware of that, but it's about us reassuring from a biological point of view that that is safe. Um, and, you know, I did some work for the Ministry of Health as part of our tumor standards to show that it was safe to wait, actually, if you had intermediate risk prostate cancer, anywhere between zero to six months, biologically didn't make a difference in terms of long-term outcomes. Well, that's good to hear. Uh, we've always got some students watching this webinar, Simon, and they asked if you could repeat yep. the red flags. So that's uh, that's nice to know. We've got some um, uh, got some students online, so that's really good. I mean, not uh, lots of people have been watching Jacinda Ardern. I'm not. We always seem to have a how many new cases there have been today or not, but that was announced at one o'clock, wasn't it? Yeah, well, they're expecting them to go up for for another sort of seven to ten days, I think, and then and then start to turn around. Um, so we got the barcode up. Um, uh, what about fluid restriction from late afternoon to reduce nocturnal polyuria? Yeah, absolutely. It's the you know we we often jump straight into medical therapy, but conservative therapy makes a massive difference in fluid intake you know, discussion about how many cups of tea they have between the hours of four and eight o'clock, having their legs elevated in the afternoon. You know, I always just give the example, you've got fluid in your legs, you lie down at night, that fluid gets processed by your kidneys and goes through your system, so that's why you pass urine more. Um, you know, you get decreased antidiuretic hormone as you get older, so you're not, you know, blocking off those kidneys overnight. Um. And you're definitely saying stop, avoid oxybutynin uh, and use uh, solifenacin? Yeah, so the only advantage of oxybutynin is it's slightly shorter acting. So we still use it often in the hospital patients with catheters, you know, acutely when they wake up from surgery. Um, but in yep. general, if you're someone in the community, I'd be going with solifenacin. Yep. Uh, the 85-year-old wanting regular anal PSA despite education otherwise, do you have a message for them? Um, it's a really hard one, but I think it's important to acknowledge where they're coming from. Um, and I'm all about shared decision making, and so it's about them being aware of that. I think we become too paternalistic in that setting. Then patients, you know, they're going to want to want what they want, and it's about getting to the point of understanding why. Um, you know, and using the right language. It's about promoting other. You know, your other health conditions are more of a priority. I'd hate for me to do something that may cause you more harm than good. 
um, you know, so, but it is an increasing problem as we get, you know, very fit 87 year olds who are going to live to 100. If they did have very high risk prostate cancer, maybe should they have treatment or not? That's always the hard question that you have to have with these patients. And they may have seen a friend die from prostate uh, cancer. Say, yeah, well, I think we can, the key thing though that you can say is that the time from no symptoms to symptoms for prostate cancer is usually somewhere between three or five years for most men. So, you know. There's, there's time, time up your sleeve. Um, yeah. Uh, so what's the impact of statins and non-steroidal anti-inflammatories on PSA concentrations? Um, uh, not, you know, in terms of anti-inflammatory, I suppose if, if the thought was there was an inflammatory component, it may lower um, the PSA. But in general, I wouldn't treat someone with anti-inflammatory to bring down their PSA. And if you're on a statin, there's generally no even major evidence that you should that has a big impact on your PSA level. Okay. Uh, current use of alpha blocker and an anticholinergic. Any advice around around this? Yep, so if you look at the, the major guidelines now, all of them say that combination therapy is a great option. And so, as I said, people are sometimes worried, could it put a man into retention? It won't. Um, but if they have a high residual volume as the driver of the reason they have urinary symptoms, you're just not going to fix that. You know, if you've got a bladder and you're only empty to here, it's a much shorter time before you need to go than if you empty all the way to here, it'll take a lot longer. So that may be sometimes the driver for some men in terms of why they have frequency. But it's worth a try and see, and it's not dangerous. Just got a figure there on the COVID virus, 83 new cases, eight in hospital, two in intensive care, one ventilated, so still slowly going up. Um, so the audience is, uh, someone just said the QR code is not working. Um, okay, I'll, maybe I, I need to probably change that. I will, I'm not sure why that's not, but in, um, maybe it was a, a website that I used. Uh, if you go on to my website, simon.vanry.co.nz, it's on that web page, or you can send me an email at, uh, at that, and I will send you the link. Um, Thanks, Simon. That's that's very user friendly. Um, probably um, just a last question here uh, about suprapubic versus. Uh, this is from somebody working, obviously, in a rest home. Uh, changing yes. catheters is so traumatic. Um, why not more suprapubic catheters? Yeah, I think it's a resource constraint. Um, often these older patients. Uh, may require sedation or general anaesthetic to have the procedure, um, and so we often that's why we often don't do it. Um, you know, there's about a three percent chance of causing a bowel injury, which can be catastrophic in a, a now elderly patient, particularly if they've had previous mm. surgery. Um, mm. Those things may make it difficult to, to place a suprapubic, but I do. It, I think it is a good option. The concern of often in the patient with dementia is that if they pull them out then they do need to be replaced within four hours or the skin will close over. And so um, that's why, uh, you know, sometimes we're, we're slightly wary in some patients because if they don't have the resource for someone to put it in, you know, if your rest home patient at nine o'clock at night calls it out and then they wait until the next morning, it may be that you can't get it back in the next day. Right. Uh, some people saying the QR code works. So you've got two options there, Simon's email, uh, Simon at vanrij.co.nz or uh, try the um, the QR code. So I think I'll draw things to a close there, Simon. Thanks very much. Okay, see you later.